Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I am in Hillsburg, California, in Sonoma, with Brooke Bannister of Bannister Wines. He's the winemaker and co-owner. And Brooke, welcome, and tell us about Bannister. Uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, Bannister was started by my mom when I was a kid, and she was the winemaker, was her vision, uh, and it came out of another business she had, which was a um, a kind of laboratory wine support business she started in the late 70s when she was just in her 20s, actually, um, and got interested in making wine. So in 1989, she started this kind of small family label, and I grew up helping her and kind of just absorbed some things, learned a little bit, did not plan on going into the wine business, but um, she had to retire earlier than she planned, so I kind of hopped in a few years ago and took over, and um, now, you know, it's kind of my problem. (laughs) If if you, the the way you look at a small business when you wake up in the morning. (laughs) So um, with Bannister, what kind of wines are you making? Well, we started out, um, I should say my mom started out specifically making Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and a little bit of Zinfandel. And that's what I had kind of learned about and grew up tasting and um, and and felt like I had a feel for. Uh, and so when I started making the wines in 2013, that's what I was doing. And then uh, as time went on, maybe 16, 17, I started making a um, Saunier style rosé. I s- added... Um, a couple of Rieslings. I started a skin contact Riesling in 2018, um, a dry Riesling, a, another really obscure varietal that my friend happened to be growing down the road called Shoireba. And uh, is there anything else? There probably is that I'm forgetting, but yeah, <laughs> there's there's a whole bunch of, of cool little things that we're doing now. And your total case production? It fluctuates between like 600 and 1100 a year, depending on fires. Mm-hmm. Depending on coronavirus, <laughs> uh, you know, all these different things have kind of taken a chunk out of what was consistently like probably 900 to 1100 a year. All of a sudden you have a year where everything has smoke taint last year and then we're down to like maybe 600 cases, maybe maybe even 500. So it, it's kind of tough to answer, but the goal would be to make, you know, 900 to 1000 cases a mm-hmm. year. On- really small producer. Um, do you have any estate vineyards or are you sourcing all your fruit? We don't own any vineyard. We never have. We've always sourced it. And you're sourcing from what areas? Sourcing from um, Alexander Valley, where I live, uh, the Chardonnay and the Shoireba, then the Sonoma Coast and Green Valley, the Russian Green Valley of the Russian River Valley for the Pinot Noirs, um, Dry Creek Valley for the Zin, and Mendocino, um, specifically Cole Ranch for the uh, two Rieslings. Mm. And where are your wines available? Are they direct to consumer and available anywhere in the country? I have a little bit of distribution in Illinois and California, and the rest is direct to consumer. Okay. So you were saying that you grew up in this and that it sort of, you were raised learning how to, with your mom working in wine, but what would you say is your first memory relevant to wine? That's a good question. I think, um, Certainly, like I remember my mom and uh, her friend Marianne opening the wine laboratory because they did that. They just rented this little storefront in downtown Healdsburg in 1979. And, you know, now Healdsburg is this like over the top, you know, um, almost obnoxious, like (laughs) tourist uh, Mecca. Uh, In 1979, there was nothing there. Wick. It was a, just a remote kind of agricultural town. It had this little plaza. There was a Greyhound bus station. There was a hardware store. I mean, you know, the dust was, you know, the, the, the um, uh, what's the plant that rolls down the... Oh, the tumbleweeds. Ro- yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, the, you know, the joke is the tumbleweeds were rolling down the street. Um, and so her doing that, it was just, you know, I, I really specifically remember them kind of opening the doors of this business and, you know... Um, and I don't think they knew for sure whether it was going to work, but it worked out really well. And I also remember um, going to wineries occasionally, you know, other to friends' wineries, you know, when she had to work, say, on a weekend or just, you know, you just go places with your parents. And I remember, you know, really smelling the 
um, the everything, those winery smells, and and being allowed to smell wine around the dinner table too. I think you know you can't um, succeed in this business if you can't really smell and taste things. And my mom was really good smelling and tasting, and I I got that from her, so I I still can remember like all those smells. Mm. And when you started drinking wine, uh, was there a particular wine that was one of those aha wines that opened your mind maybe to pursue this path or opened your mind in a way you hadn't anticipated with wine? There was not, there was never an aha moment for me, I would say, because she started making Pinot Noir and that was just always around. So smelling and tasting Pinot Noir was just kind of second nature to me. And um, I was very familiar with that. I, and I think because my mom loved that, that was her favorite wine. I, you know, I think somehow that was genetic too, because that was always my favorite wine. Um, but I had, you know, other aha moments along the way. Like, you know, I made this skin contact recently, and that didn't know if it was going to work or not. And, you know, uh, bottling it and then waiting a while, opening the bottle and not knowing what you're going to get, and you're like, damn, that actually worked <laughs> out. So. You know, though you have those little aha moments, you know, along the way, for sure, with other things. Yeah. Um, you kind of created your own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, but do you taste, do you get the opportunity to taste wines all over the world? I mean, if in your wine cellar, in your own personal wine cellar, is it mostly domestic and local and friend stuff, or is there an eclectic mix? Uh, you know, there's not much in my wine cellar, to be honest. Um I, you know, I I don't want to get too burned out on wine. That's one thing is like, even though I'm curious about it um, and I like tasting it, smelling it, I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time like seeking it out. Um, I do like tasting my friend's wines. Um, I'm I'm not very experienced in tasting international wines. I'm certainly like curious how wine's made in other places, but um, there's just so many other things going on in life. You know, I have other... um, I have other things going on um, too, so I'm just like, I, the time that I have to focus on this, I, 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 I do that. And but the the whole kind of going out and like wine travel and stuff, I've just not ever done. Mm-hmm. Well, so one more thing to say though, but that's also I think partially because I grew up around it so much, I just never felt it was never a mystery to me. It was like so common to me <laughs> that I, it wasn't something I I needed to go out and like discover, so to mm-hmm. speak, right? Like. It was discovered for me whether I wanted it to be discovered or not. Right. So with the wines that you make and and growing up, obviously, Pinot Noir was something very prevalent in your life and working with different grapes. Is there to you a such thing as a perfect variety? No, uh, no, I've never even like thought about it in that way. Um, No, there's not. (laughs) And as a small producer, what's your take on wine critics and scores? Uh, it's total horseshit. <laughs> and I didn't know that, um, you know, mm-hmm. when my mom got into the wine business, um, and was trying to make it work and her friends were trying to make it work, wine scores were really important and they, um, they really drove sales for that generation. They still drive sales for somebody, but I, uh, I realized after doing this for a few years that... There are a bunch of brands out there that make wines specifically to suit the palates of the people that judge wines. Once I realized that, and it's not something I'm interested in doing at all because the wine should be an expression of the vineyard and your personality as a winemaker and what you believe in, the whole thing is a scam and I'm not interested at all. Um, You know, I I don't wanna, I know there are people that score wines that are really passionate about wine, that love wine, but, and so it's not that I think their passion for wine is a scam, but the result feels like kind of a scam to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it also just, the other thing is, if it doesn't lead to sales anymore, which we have to make a living at this, you know, or we shouldn't do it, you know, mm-hmm. you got to pay the farmer to grow the grapes and you got to, you know, pay for the glass to put the wine bottle in. Um, but the thing that sells wine is meeting people, meeting the general public and having them have a connection to the winery. And the, the, you know, the whole score thing, more and more of me just feels like also something for the ego of the winemaker. And that doesn't interest me at all. Like, I don't need that. Um, I'm, I'm good. I'm happy. <laughs> I have like all kinds of creative outlets in my life. Um, I, even, I have another, you know, career on the side of this too. So I just, I'm just not interested in that game. Yeah. So for somebody who hasn't had the pleasure to taste banister wines yet, what do you think they're missing out on? 
Well, I mean, there's a lot of good wine out there. I'm not going to mm-hmm. act like I make the only good wine. No, so no. they may not be missing out on anything. <laughs> but I will say that, like, um, I hope if they're not tasting my wines that they're looking to drink the wines made by somebody who makes a small production, who really has their hand in it, who charges, like, fair prices, who's trying to work with people that farm correctly. Because, um, like, we, you know, in every agricultural industry on this planet, we need to get going, like, into like organic and sustainable like methodology as fast as we can or we're all hosed Mm -hmm. so um that's what i think people should be looking for um you know that's that's my view and that's the view of plenty of other people in the wine industry so drink their wines i guess is what i would say or drink your wines yeah (laughs) i mean it's equal to all but i think you know banister it's so interesting i mean just sitting in front of me and some of the grapes you mentioned it's a really kind of uh, Riesling, Pinot, very traditional grapes, yet at the same time, uh, Shrebe, very unique and different. Yeah. So. I, you know, part of um, it is that I, uh, it's kind of a social um, business here. You know, I, I know a lot of people that, that farm, I know other people that make wine, and so if you're friends with people and you have good relationships, like things, opportunities just pop up. And you know, the Shorebe thing was my friend who got these cuttings from Joseph Phelps going to Germany years ago to, to get some stuff um, and bring cuttings back. My friend ended up with some Shoreba cuttings and like, next thing you know, I've, I'm Shoreba as part of my lineup. Um, and which is, seems really random, but I, since I was already doing the Rieslings, um, there's actually kind of a fit there for it. Yeah. It, it. It makes some sense. Absolutely. So if space aliens were to land at your property right now, which of your wines would you want to introduce, welcome them with? Are these friendly or unfriendly? <laughs> Absolutely <aliens>? friendly. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'd probably start them out with Pinot Noir just because... Um, I'm not going to pretend that that's not the you know the wine that's been most important to our family over the years, mm-hmm. and that we put the most effort into, and comes at the greatest cost for us to make. Um, and uh, you know, it's just if if you only had time to taste a couple wines, you got to you have to taste Pinot Noir. It's just it's amazing. <laughs> for you as a wine drinker, red, white, or rosé? That's so dependent on. Um, like the day and the temperature and all that. Um, but, uh, you know, I really like drinking reds with food, obviously. So, um, but like if I'm hanging out, you know, in the afternoon with my son uh, and he's eating like, you know, those cheese, Cheeto snacks, like some rosé goes really good with those. <laughs> I hope for you, not for him. No, yeah, for me. Yeah. Uh, still or sparkling? Uh, you know, I don't drink much sparkling wine just because it, it doesn't come across the table very often. I love it. Champagne's delicious. Yeah. Um, and Prosecco's can be fantastic. They're, they're great. But, uh, you know, I've got so much wine already sitting around that are still wines. I end up drinking still wine most of the time. So you said you like to have red wine with food. Um, do you? How do you approach food and wine pairing? And how, how do you recommend other people do it? Do you think there are certain rules that should be followed or... Or tips, you know, in what to look for when they're picking a wine to pair with food or picking a food to pair with wine? Well, I mean, I I think your palate should tell you, but obviously if you don't have the opportunity to just like open wines, cook a bunch of food and, you know, if if you've got to nail it the first time, um, I think, well, obviously the internet's full of useful (laughs) information. But, um, you know, Pinots go with like, or is it to medium bodied wine to a light bodied wine? And so I think, you know, people could make the um, think about foods and kind of picture what would be in the, the scale of, you know, rich to light food. What would land in that? You know, I think I, I had a, uh, a boss when I was younger doing construction work that would always just say, figure it out. Um, so. To some degree, I think, you know, people should trust themselves to figure things like that out. Um, I, I think there's often like a, cre- a mystique created around wine um, that the wine industry relies on to have the general public come and ask the wine industry for its expertise when actually the general public can uh, solve a lot of its own or answer a lot of its own questions. Um But I mean, there are classic things with like Pinot Noir, like, you know, duck is just 
they were made for each other. They're, you know, they were, um, and you know, Zinfandel and barbecue is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, these Rieslings go really well with Asian food, and I, I love Asian food, love it. Um, can't get enough of it. So, so I was saying earlier, like subconsciously, I'm probably trying to make wines that go with Asian food to a certain degree, and the Rieslings really, really are nice with, mm -hmm. with um, Thai, um, Korean. Um, Indian, like, you know, the, the spice and stuff. yeah, not heavy spice, but mm -hmm. some spice for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Hmm. Making me hungry. <laughs> so you're working with a lot of different vineyards, um, but you're spending time in these vineyards. You were talking before how you really care how these vineyards are taken care of, that it's about sustainability. It's about uh, thinking of it. So um, how much, how much variation do you see vintage to vintage, you know, spending this time in the vineyards? What are you seeing more often than not, or is it really just different every year? Yeah, I mean, if you think about, um, like, there's a, there's a matrix and a grape of all these different compounds that become the wine you end up drinking. And every weather event over the course of a year affects the matrix in that, of all those compounds in that mm -hmm. grape. So every year is different. Now, you may not taste much difference from your year because it's still the same clone, you know, it was still picked at a very similar bricks. You made it with a very similar uh, protocol in the winery, but there's some difference. So um, what I'm seeing like year to year is often subtle. Maybe though, if you're like looking at it over decades, obviously you're seeing changes because we don't have as much uh, cloud cover here in the summer as we used to that would lengthen the growing season. So harvests are happening a little sooner sometimes we're having a little more say desiccation because of heat events sometimes mm -hmm. so like climate change is definitely affecting the wine industry the, the wines are still coming out good i think you know there's there's been a real fear that um it would affect quality and it probably will down the road you know everybody's gonna suffer because of this um there's just no way around it but so far the wines are still really good um i think you know it's a combination of it the the effect of it being somewhat subtle and also that there's a lot of uh, really good farming knowledge out there now. Farmers are really good at handling adverse conditions and uh, handling weather events and, you know, winemakers have seen a lot of stuff themselves and know how to kind of adjust and make changes. So, you know, we're doing a pretty good job of handling that. Yeah. When you go and visit these vineyards and walk through them, do you ever talk to the vines? No. No? <laughs> no. Do they talk to you? <laughs> uh, you know, I feel that way about trees. I don't really feel that way when I'm in like an agricultural setting. I like grapevines. They're really cool. They're really cool to look at. It's really fun walking through vineyards. But I don't have, I don't hold them in quite the same esteem that I hold like a tree. You know, mm. a, a big ancient tree is like really needs to be taken seriously and respected. Huh. There's some ancient vines that I saw recently, and it made me think for the first time about all that history, that yeah, ancientness. Th those are cool, and it, it hurts a little bit when you see those get torn out. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, it's just because they're at the end of their life, they're no longer productive. Sometimes, you know, you get, there's a lot of greedy people in the wine industry, too, so people tear them out just because it doesn't suit them. Mm -hmm. um, so that happens for all reasons, and yeah, it's, it's, you hate to see those old vines go. But like the, that Pinot there, that, um, the old vine swan clone, I mean, those, those vines are ancient. They're barely alive. Um, and it's cool because they're neat to look at. They're really gnarly. And uh, they, you know, they have a hard time ripening the clusters because they're just, they, they're so low on energy in their old age. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, you know, there's, there's, there's cool, interesting situations to run into out in the vineyard for sure that are, you know, yeah. kind of compelling. So when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I... I think I wanted to be a professional athlete when I was younger. And uh, what sport? Uh, you know, I kind of went through a lot of different sports. I, I liked soccer. I liked baseball. Um, I ran track and field. Um, and, uh, and I did some of that in college, and then kind of moved on to other stuff. Um, but then I wanted to be a professional artist, and I have been a professional artist. Um, and what kind of art do you do? Um, I have off and on been uh, built furniture, designed and built furniture, and I've been a professional musician as well. Oh, what, what do you play? Um, I sing and play guitar and piano, um, bass. Yeah. 
there's always sort of a nice correlation, I think, between wine and music, which we're going to get to just a little bit. But um. I, I will say, though, like I, I to, to certain degree, I think there's a there's a definitely a correlation with creativity, mm-hmm. um, although I am I come from the dirtier, grimier side of rock and roll. Like I like that, you know, um, I, I don't like the like gentle, like, um, you, you know, part of uh, <laughs> some people make associations with like somebody playing the harp, you know, in a oh, tasting no. room or something like that. <laughs> no, that no, we're not uh, so, to each their own for yeah. music. But no, harp playing is not my thing either. Well, you know, I'm, I'm using that as kind of a as, as an anecdote, not as a like, li- not literally. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know you said that, you know, you're, you're not, you have a lot of other things going on, but you have a lot of your own wine here. Is there a particular wine you and your wife like to enjoy for a special evening? Um, you know, my wife luckily is like, she doesn't care about the technical side of wine. Um, and luckily isn't really like interested in being part of the business. Like my hat's off to couples that can work together, but like. (laughs) That is not going to happen here. And so it's good that we have a separation of things. So I think she's kind of happy with whatever I, you know, have open. And yeah, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that is. It's kind of nice. She's not involved in it yet. Enjoys it all. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So when you, when you're going about your daily business or when you look back and think about advice you've been given over the years that guides you through how you do your work or your life, is there a piece of advice that, that really sticks with you? Uh, well, I think um, there's not like a, I'm not gonna give you a piece of advice that's like a verbatim sentence, mm-hmm. but certainly I got the impression from my parents growing up that there was no pressure to go into any particular thing. Like I could do whatever I wanted to. Uh, and I think that is critical because um, I think people should do something that's meaningful. Um, and, you know, we all have, still feel like sometimes like we're not maybe not doing that, but at least like knowing that you're allowed to do that and being on a path towards that. Um, because honestly, like the wine business is interesting. It's fun. Actually, uh, the wine business is not interesting. I, I take that back. Wine business is just business like anything else. Wine making to me is interesting. There's some people that love sales, like they're born for it. I'm not, so, but that's cool. I'm, I actually really appreciate people that that love doing sales and all that. I don't like it personally, but that's just a, a right? That's all about our personalities. Right. Um, but um, uh, I think uh, m- like I, I try and spend as much time I can with my son, and that often means like I'm not necessarily working, and and uh, we're supposed to feel guilty as Americans when we do that. And I think uh, getting yourself free of of those kind of limitations is crucial to feeling good about your life. Mm-hmm. So, so what do you like to do in your free time? Well, I like hanging out with my with my kid. I mean, that's like. You know, there's eating Cheetos and drinking yeah, rosé. Yeah. Um, you know, we we go hiking around here. Um, we go, you know, camp. We go camping and backpacking in the summertime. Um, or just whatever, you know. Just go. We go to the bookstore. But um, you know, the point is, like, life. Life seems to me like it goes by fast. That's mm-hmm. all. I've always felt that way, and um, I, I don't want to ever like get to a point where I was like damn, I was working instead of like spending time with the people I loved. So Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to tell yourself you're going to do that and it's okay. So when you look back at your career, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date? I I mean, family I know is probably Mm -hmm. your proudest. So I'm asking outside of family, is there something in your entire career? It doesn't have to be wine. could be wine. Uh... I don't look at things that way, to be honest. To me, that's a little bit of that same, like, ego trap. Um, For me, like, when you make a piece of art uh, and you put it out in the world, like, you're done with it. It's it's now the public's to, like, interact with and, like, debate and enjoy or hate or whatever. And and then you move on to the next thing. That's kind of how I feel about stuff. So, um, 
So like, I, I, it's not that I'm not proud, but I just don't stop to really think about things in those terms, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. It does, it does. So I want you to complete a sentence for me. A table without wine is like... <laughs> um, a table without wine is probably a table where people don't like food very much or, <laughs> you know, don't do much cooking. <laughs> So we're sitting here at your table. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful table that you made yourself, which is absolutely gorgeous. A big, large wooden table. There is a lot of banister wine sitting on this table. A lot of bottles sitting here in front of us. I'm wondering if you could share a bottle of banister wine with anyone from any walk of life, living or deceased, who would you like to be sitting at this table with us right now? You know, it's funny. I was thinking about that the other day where people always ask, like, if you could go to dinner with like two people, you know, who would it be? <laughs> and uh, for some reason I was driving down the freeway and I thought about that and I was like, uh, I would go, I would do it with um, Barack Obama and Patty Smith <laughs> because... I like that. It's an interesting combination. Yeah, but... they like, A, I, I have a ton of respect for both of them. I think they both... Um, they were the person for a time and a place and everything kind of flowed through them and they, they kind of knew everybody and were at the center of these really interesting times. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that's my, I, like I don't that. even know if Patty Smith drinks, but you know. Um, you know, maybe yeah. you, you never know. <laughs> yeah, so. But, Very cool. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's a good thing you thought about that earlier this week yeah, without any yeah. prompting from me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> So just as we finish up, I know you spoke about being into music and how you're a musician and we're not talking about harps here and I'd love it just based on the type of music you like. But so many times, you know, uh, wine creates an emotion and people, a lot has to do with who you're drinking with and everything. And music does the same thing. So if you were going to put a song, an artist or a genre to your wines, I'd love you to try to do that for a couple of your wines. So we have your... um, (laughs) <laughs> Just a couple. That's fine. Okay. So you're Riesling, but not the skin contact one. Um, David Bowie. Okay. And your skin contact Riesling. Uh, Santi Gold. Okay. And your Sherebe. Wilco. And your Pinot Noir. Uh, Bruce Springsteen. Ooh. See, easy. Yeah. You did it. <laughs> but they each can draw up something, so I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to try that pairing later. Um, so, Brooke, one more question. I know you said you haven't traveled a lot to other countries and to other wine regions, but domestically or internationally, is there one region that is on sort of the top of your list that you'd love to go check out? You know, there's a bunch actually. Um, I'd like to check out some of the Croatian. Uh, wines just because that was kind of the genesis for me being interested in the making a skin contact Riesling Um, because what I was reading about like seemed to happen primarily uh, there and also talking to people that had had orange wines most of them had um, had them in Croatia or had them come from Croatia so that Mm kind of was that seemed to me like the focal point of that Um, I lived in Italy when I was young and I drank a lot of wine. I didn't pay a ton of attention. I can remember how it tasted because like I have that thing where your brain kind of catalogs all the tastes you ever came across. But I'd like to go back actually focus like with an understanding of winemaking. And um, and then I'm actually, I, I know it sounds um, kind of like everybody says this, but I would like to taste a bunch of Burgundy wines just because <laughs> it's really cool. Like their pH is so um, different. You know, that stuff comes in at like 3.1, 3.2, you know, screaming acid. And so that's why like 10 year old Burgundies are just like drinkable. Whereas like in California, they're done. Mm -hmm. Um, And to me, so there's some really interesting differences that would just be cool to kind of put in the glass and and talk to people about like how you handle those different, um, if you have different chemistry, like how you handle that. Yeah, very cool. Well. You should start planning one of those trips. And for any of our listeners that are planning a trip to Sonoma, um, how can they, can they visit Bannister? How can they taste your wines? They just have to email um, to the website and see. uh, I do do some private tastings by appointment. You just, you know, if I'm, if I'm available, I'll do it. Um, it, I like meeting people. It's just, I'm a one man operation. So um, it's like, it's just got to look at the schedule, look at the calendar. Yeah. And people can also order online, yeah. correct? Yeah. And your website? Bannisterwines.com. 
So go to BannisterWines.com, check out the wines, very small production, Sonoma producer, but also if you're coming up here, it's pretty special because if you can get an appointment, you'd be one of the few. So... Brooke, thank you so much for joining us today on Wine Soundtrack. Thanks, Allison. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.